meet the laws of uh, Jewish life and living. Today's Torah study has been uh, sponsored by Jay and uh, Stephanie uh, Marmer in loving memory of Stephanie's um, Stephanie's brother, Bert, Bert Stolerman. Dov Ber Avraham Ben Hershleib, his neshama should have an aliyah in Gan Eden. And uh, that's what's going on here today on January 7th, where uh, we're commemorating his yard site and learning about the laws of Jewish life and living. Halacha is a very, very important part of Jewish uh, culture and tradition to know how to live a Jewish life. The, 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 law, the, the beauty is in the details. It's not just enough to have a helicopter view, uh, a general overview and over understanding and feeling of Judaism. It's about... It's about being able to really go through the nuances and the details, just like in a relationship. When you love someone, you don't just say, well, I generally love you, so it doesn't really matter how I behave towards you. On the contrary, when you truly love someone, you want to behave properly towards them the way they want. And that's why it's important to learn the laws of halacha to be able to uh, know how to behave with regards to Hashem, how Hashem wants us to behave. Um, Good morning, Corey and Marty. Thank you very much for your um, blessing. And Elaine also, and to everyone else who's with us live and later, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Please post your comments here in the groups. And uh, if you're listening later, then post your comments on on, on email to rabbi at jewishgardens.com. That's rabbi at jewishgardens.com. Um, if you missed last night's program, it was beautiful, a really sensational program with the Jewish Michael Jordan. It's a very, very special program presentation on Windows to the World, a presentation of Jewish pride in the most unlikeliest of arenas <laughs> on the basketball court in the, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the global television, in front of the global televisions. It was really something very, very special with Tamir Goodman, the Jewish Michael Jordan. Very special program. Um, these Windows to the World programs, some of you just telling me, are sensational. And please make note of them. They're all printed, published, pre-advertised in the Jewish community calendar, which you should have received in the mail a few months ago. That's the Jewish Community Calendar here from Chabad Palm Beach Gardens. Um, you can also find the Jewish Community Calendar on our website at jewishgardens.com. That's jewishgardens.com where you can find all of the events, every single event, class, program, and lecture, and everything of the entire year of 5781, this uh, Jewish year from September through September 2021. All of that is in the Jewish calendar. So make note of the Jewish calendar. Look at the programs carefully. See what, what piques your interest and mark it down in your calendar so that you'll be able to participate in the tent. Um, good morning to you, Stephanie Marmer, um, in memory of your brother, of Bert Stoleman, whose yard said is today. We just mentioned that. And to Elaine, thank you very much for your comments. His story was indeed awesome. Good morning, Dean and Ed. And Corey, so impressive. I think you were talking about the presentation last night, which absolutely was truly impressive. Great. So let's go straight into this. Um, many of us have learned, have heard about meat and milk. We know about this thing of meat and milk. But now we're getting a little bit out of our comfort zones as we're learning about the difference between a uh, separation of meat and fish. And it always raises an eyebrow. It's like, what? What? Meat and fish? I mean, I know about meat and milk, but meat and fish? I didn't know about this. You mean, Rabbi, I need another kitchen? If you've been to my house, <laughs> we built our kitchen, like two separate kitchens. We have a milk kitchen and a fleshy kitchen. <laughs> just happens to be we have this big beam in between. It looks like two separate kitchens. So you'd think, I remember when the kitchen designer was doing our kitchen, he said to me, can you tell me again why you need four ovens? You know, four ovens, you sure? Milk and fleshy and pyrev, right? So... Two for milk, two for fleshik. I'm sorry, a lot of guests. Two for fleshik, one for milchik, one for pyrev. But you really need another oven for, um, you know, for for fish. What's the story? And that's what we're going to be learning about today, with the separation between meat and fish as it comes to pertains to vessels. We might get a chance to touch about to touch on meat and on, on fish and, and milk as well. Okay. In fact, um, you know, let's go straight into meat and fish. Sorry, into, into fish, and, fish and dairy first. Let's go straight into fish and dairy. We'll start with that, okay? One of the most interesting stories <laughs> of Judaism is a verse, one of the most interesting, uh, most intriguing episodes of Judaism. It's something that happened 500 years ago. In something that the Code of Jewish Law wrote. Now, this is going to be interesting. 
The Beit Yosef is Rabbi Yosef Karo. He was named Karo because he originally came from Cairo in uh, Egypt. However, he lived his last days, his last years in Tzfat in the north of Israel in the golden era of war Jewry in the north of Israel in the city of Tzfat, sometimes known as Safed for some funny reason that they misspelled the word Tzfat, but they call it Safed. Anyways, up in the mountain, it's, 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 uh, the, um, it's the mountain of Kabbalah. It's where some of the greatest minds of all of Jewish history ever lived, certainly in the last millennium, 500 years ago. There, the Beit Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, had his court. And you can still go to the shul where you see the elevated bima, the elevated platform where he held court, where they literally wrote the code of Jewish law. This was during the time of the, the saint Yarizal who wrote much of the Kabbalah. Rabbi Moshe Kodovero, the teacher of the Yarizal. Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz who wrote the Lechadodi and many other poems of our lit liturgy. Um... Alf, uh, not Alfasi, um, many, many of the great Kabbalists and Torah commentaries were there at that time, and they all lived around the same time. So what happened was Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Code of Jewish Law, he wrote a sentence inside of the laws of meat and milk, which seemed to have been a mistake. M many of the codifiers had a, a uh, typo like a typing error, right? However, it was his, his quill. It was like, a, like a, a burp of the quill is how you call it, like a, a burp of the quill, as if the quill kind of like sent something out. Now, what, why would the quill have written something which didn't really flow within the context? This is very important. Why would the quill have done this? You have to understand that most of these codifiers, most of the great Jewish leaders, until the time of the Taz, Rabbi David Halevi, who happens to have been an ancestor of mine, he lived um, right around that time, about 400 years ago. Up until the time of the Taz, the Rebbe tells us that just about all of the codifiers of Jewish law had Ruach HaKodesh, had divine inspiration. What that means is like this, is that when they were writing, when they were writing their Torah ideas, they were divinely inspired, much like Moses. It says about Moses, that the divine spirit would speak through his throat. He would literally open his mouth and the divine spirit would come out of his throat. In a more diminished form of, of prophecy, maybe a prophet would be one that, that opens his mouth, and God speaks through his mouth. That's a prophecy. But in a more diminished form of prophecy is when you start writing something and the ideas that come to you are divinely inspired. It's Ruach HaKodesh, the divine spirit. Now, all of us experience, lest you think that this is something out of this world, extraordinary and crazy and um, hocus pocus, every single one of us experiences a miniature form of prophecy when we have to name our children. This is what the Torah tells us, that when you name your child, when you give your child its Hebrew name, why do you choose a certain name? Why are you drawn towards one name and drawn away from another name? The reason is because it's a nevua ketana. It's called a small prophecy. What does that mean? The name of a person is, is associated with their destiny. If my name is David, if my name is David Svi, then the combination of those six letters has something to do with my destiny. I'm not sure what it is, but the seers, the visionaries, the prophets are able to understand this. Why my parents chose to give me this name and my brother got a different name is because they experienced a miniature form of prophecy at the time of my naming, which is why they chose my name and not a different name. And this happens to every parent regardless of status or standing of their spiritual status or religious standing. It doesn't make a difference. And by virtue of having a child and naming that child, you are given a miniature form of prophecy. Now, do you feel the prophecy? I don't think anybody in this forum would say that they felt divinely inspired when they named their child. But I could tell you that I felt drawn towards one or drawn away from another. And I can't really explain it. The reason for that is because we experience a miniature form of divine prophecy. Now, with that context, with that background, the... All the Torah commentaries up until the time of the Taz, about 400 years ago, we can safely assume that all of them were divinely inspired. After that, it's not so clear. Some yes, some not. Maybe most not, 
and some yes. So that's where things get a little more cloudy. So therefore, when we go back 500 years to the base, Yosef to Rabbi Yosef Kara, the author of the Code of Jewish Law, the Code of Jewish Law according to the Sephardic way of living as opposed to Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who, sorry, uh, the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Israelish from Krakow, sorry, that was the K, Krakow for Krakow, for uh, Rabbi Moshe Israelish, Rabbi Moshe Israelish, who authored the Code of Jewish Law for Ashkenazim, and together they bound it as one, as a collective code of Jewish law for all the Jewish people with the customs of the Sephardim and the customs of the Ashkenazim. One Torah with different customs. And what happened here was that when the Beis Yosef was writing about the laws of meat and milk, suddenly in the middle of nowhere, he wrote about He's speaking about mixing meat and, meat and milk, not to mix meat and milk, and therefore you shouldn't mix, and, mix meat and milk, and therefore you shouldn't mix... Uh, fish and milk and you look at it like what where did the fish and milk come from we're talking about meat and milk all the time when suddenly he writes therefore you shouldn't mix fish and milk seems like a spelling mistake so there are those that want to say well it's a spelling mistake but there are those that say no 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 the base yosef was divinely inspired and if his quill let out that word of fish it means that it was divine sent Right? Let's take a closer look. The base Yosef says that you shouldn't mix, eat meat, sorry, you shouldn't eat fish and milk because of danger. Because it's a danger to mix fish and milk. Now, the Ramasha Isterlish the, of the, the, the Ashkenazi Code of Jewish Law wrote in his book, as well as the Shach and the Taz also, they wrote that this must be an error. And he meant to say That you're not allowed to eat fish with meat. You're not allowed to eat fish with meat. And he did not mean to say that you're not allowed to eat fish with milk. Because we've never found a stringency of prohibiting us to mix fish with milk. The stringency is only with regards to fish and meat. So again, I think I mentioned before that, we, that it was in the context the meat and milk was a mistake the fish and meat that was the context we learned last week that there's a a pro, pro, uh, that there's a um, a sakana a danger of mixing meat and fish together we spoke about saras was the spiritual disease a spiritual disease that is caused through lush and hara through speaking badly about another person but somehow it's connected to the mixture of meat and fish and in the middle of the conversation about mixing meat and fish the Beis Yosef suddenly writes, therefore you shouldn't mix, you shouldn't eat fish and milk because of danger. And that seems to be an error. But there are those of us that say, no, it's not an error. Every word that comes out of the Beis Yosef is, um, is holy and divinely inspired. Rabbeinu Bachai, who is the author of the Gates of Trust, Shara Bitoch, and he wrote, writes that there is indeed a danger, a spiritual danger to mix the eating of fish with milk. And in also another commentary, they write, a danger. Why? He explains a little more detail because fish make you cold and that ruins the milk and it causes the milk to be harmful. Whatever. Bottom line is, most of the Ashkenazi codifiers rule that there is no prohibition to mix the eating of fish and milk or fish and cheese. However, the Sephardic codifiers rule that the words of the Beis Yosef stand. It is not a spelling mistake. This is why it's so interesting. Great debate here. And therefore, you should not, according to the Sephardic codifiers, you shouldn't mix the eating of fish with milk because of danger. It's not a mistake. And we're stringent with this. And therefore, they, what they do is, is that they're careful not to eat fish with milk or cheese, but they do allow other forms of dairy like butter. The Ben Ishchai was the chief rabbi of Baghdad, Sephardic, was strict, and he ruled that even butter with uh, fish is prohibited. And now this is where things get tricky when it comes to our bagel and lox sandwich, right? Our bagels and lox sandwich, what happens? Are, are you allowed to eat a bagels and lox sandwich, which would mean lox and cream cheese? According to the Sephardim, it would seem to be a problem. 
According to the Ashkenazim, no problem at all. So, you know, when it comes to rice, we know about the big debate with rice on Passover and legumes. If you're allowed to eat legumes on Passover, rice being a legume, according to the Ashkenazim, we do not eat rice on Passover, but the Sephardim do. Same debate would be here, but in the reverse, where the Sephardim are more stringent than the Ashkenazim. The Sephardim say, you may not eat dairy and fish together. Ashkenazim say it's okay. So you you gotta pick you, you gotta pick. You know, you can't be Ashkenazi when it comes to fish and milk and Sephardi when it comes to rice and pesach. You gotta be consistent, and that's how you serve God. It's like uh it's not like you go for the for all, all the all, all the all the leniencies and you pick the leniencies that suit your lifestyle, suit your fancy. What you're supposed to do is you go down a lane. You know, when the Jews crossed the Red Sea. Interesting, they didn't have one lane through which they crossed the Red Sea. There were 13 lanes corresponding to the 13 tribes of Israel. Remember, the tribe of Joseph was divided into two, Menashe and Ephraim. There were 13 different lanes. Why do we need 13 different lanes? The reason is because there are 13 different ways to serve God. Does would that mean one of them is right and one of them is wrong? No, they're just different. If you could just stick to your lane, you'll be okay. So you'll notice that the, the sitter of the Sephardim is different to the sitter of the Ashkenazim, which is different to the sitter of the Chabad, which is different to the sitter of someone else. Does that mean one of them is right or one of them is wrong? No. It just means that when you stick to your way, you're good. But if you start to make a mishka bubble of using the Sephardic sitter, but you do eat dairy with fish, like the Ashkenazim, and maybe you do something else with rice, then you, you're making a big challenge. That's a mess. Don't, you can't do that. You gotta go to your um, you gotta go with your with your uh, kav, with your derech. What's the chabad way? The chabad way is like this is that we're careful not to mix actual fish with actual milk. However, we are lenient when it comes to eating fish with something else, dairy, like like uh, butter or some other sort of cream. Because the prohibition, we go literal with the prohibition. Again, it was based on a on a on what seems to be a typo. So the Chabad approaches to say, okay, so exactly what it says is what's prohibited, which is the fish and the milk. So only if it's actual milk with actual fish. But if it's not actual milk, let's say it's cream cheese, it's the different form of dairy. Then we are allowed to eat it together, and that's why the bagel lox, bagels and lox. What do you call it? cream cheese and lox? A, a lox. Bagels and locks, whatever. Um, that would be allowed according to Chabad. But according to the Sephardim, it's a problem. The Sephardim have a real problem eating bagels and locks. Those that don't eat fish and even cheese together can eat them one after the other. You don't need to wait an hour like after milk before meat. Or you don't need to wait six hours like after meat before milk. You can just eat them successively as long as you make some sort of a division between them. Um, just like you would after fish before meat. For the Ashkenazim, it's enough to just wash your mouth out, certainly. Either the Chabad approach um, is, to, is to separate between the fish and the milk. But for the Sephardim, you have to wash your mouth as well as your hands, right? Now, one final question over here is what would happen when it comes to the dishes? What about the dishes that you used for fish, can you cook milk in them and vice versa? Question coming in on YouTube is that the amount is the amount to be considered. Remember how the Egyptians used to feed the elder child more? The Egyptians used to feed the elder child more. I'm not familiar, S Air, what you're talking about with the Egyptians feeding the elder child more. I don't know what that's talking about. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, if you could be more specific, that would be nice. Um, the amount to be considered does not seem to make a difference. I've not seen any source to say that there's any difference to the amount. That's even a tiny drop of meat and a tiny drop of milk when it comes to the mixture of meat and milk. And I don't see why it would be any different when it comes to the mixture of fish and milk or the mixture of fish and dairy. Okay. Um, so the final point I'd like to cover over here is the, 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 the vessels. What about the vessels, the dishes, right? We're, we're, a fundamental principle of kosher we learned was that most people, many people make the mistake to say that only actual meat and only actual treif is prohibited. Actual meat with actual milk to be mixed or actual treif is prohibited. But what they don't understand is that, or they don't know, is that it's not the actual meat and the actual treif which is prohibited. It's the flavor. 
even the flavor of the of the meat and milk, even the flavor of the tray is prohibited, which means that if you go to a tray for restaurant, God forbid, and you're ordering a kosher fish. So what happens? They're cooking you a kosher fish in a non-kosher frying pan. And that non-kosher frying pan was clean. But if that non-kosher frying pan was used for treif in the past 24 hours, then the flavor inside of the vessel is called benyomo, is called fresh, it's alive. The flavor is inside, the non-kosher flavor is inside the walls of that frying pan. And therefore, the, the non-kosher flavor of the treif inside that frying pan is going into your kosher fish. Right? So this is a very important principle. Same thing applies to mixing meat and milk, kosher meat and kosher milk. It's not only actual meat and actual milk, which is prohibited as in a cheeseburger, but even if you're cooking your, your um, let's say you're making yourself a dairy, a dairy omelet inside of a frying pan that was used this morning or yesterday within 24 hours for meat, what happens is, is that the flavor of the meat, the kosher meat is fresh in the walls of this frying pan, and that fresh flavor of meat is going into the cheese omelet, which is making it an actual mixture of meat and milk. It's the flavor that's prohibited as well as the actual meat and actual milk. So what, how do we apply this principle, this prohibition to, to fish and milk? The answer is like this. We do not, we're not stringent with the with uh, dishes with regards to fish and, and milk. Remember the origin, the source of the origin, the source of the prohibition. So in the case of meat and milk, the source of the prohibition is biblical. It is absolutely biblical that prohibits us to three things from meat and milk, to eat them together, to cook them together, and to benefit from them cooked together. So those are biblical prohibitions, and they extend even into flavor and even into dishes with all of the ancillary and tangential uh, applications of the mixture. However, when it comes to fish and milk, since the prohibition of fish and milk is based upon what seems to be a spelling mistake, Therefore, we only take it like the Chabad custom is, only as it's written. Fish actual with milk actual, not to, not to include in the prohibition, other dairy products. So it's okay to have cream cheese and, and, and fish, right? But when it comes to the flavor as well, it's also not a prohibition. We don't extend the prohibition to the fish and the milk as it's as it's. Uh, uh, infused within the walls of the frying pan. What that means is like this. If you use the frying pan for dairy omelet this morning at 6 a.m. And then at 9 a.m. you want to make, uh, you want to prepare for lunch with, you want to make a fish, a nice uh, rainbow trout on the same frying pan. The fish in the same frying pan that had the milk in it this morning. Is that a problem? The answer is no. Even the people that don't eat, mix, that don't eat milk together with fish together, will also be careful, uh, um, will not be careful to, you, to make fish, to cook fish in a clean dairy pot, even if it's been used within the past 24 hours, which means it's been yomo, which means that the flavor uh, of the dairy is inside alive and fresh in it. Similarly with baking. You're allowed to bake fish in an oven, which is dairy, even if that oven, the dairy oven was used for actual dairy within the past 24 hours. And even if there's leftover cheese or something or, or milk at the bottom of the oven, like there's um, oil or there's some, uh, some yellow cheese or something which is left over, you still are able to use it to cook your fish because the leftovers are allowed to be eaten with the fish itself. Remember, the prohibition is only, certainly according to Chabad, the prohibition is only with um, actual fish and actual milk. Right? Uh, the part, of the pro part of the reason why they're so strict, so, so lenient when it comes to cooking or baking fish in an oven, which in a dairy oven, which is still dirty from the dairy, is because the, the leftover um, oil um, of the um, of the of, of the dairy is is weakened because it's being burned by the heat. How much more so if it comes from um, cheese or milk, which is not anything which can really hold any any flavor anymore once it's been burned. Okay, so that really uh, concludes what we're learning today about fish and milk and fish and meat. A fascinating concept. Um, the prohibition of mixing fish and meat and, and, and milk together based upon what seems to be plitas akulmus, the, the um, burping of the, of the quill.
the burping of the quill. Was that a mistake, or do, is it something which we to which we attribute a spiritual intention? We as Chabadniks certainly do give it a spiritual intention. The Sephardic also give it uh, spiritual intention. It's Ashkenazim that are far more skeptical about it, and therefore you got to pick your path, which is your way. Maybe speak to your rabbi to find out which way you want to go. But remember, if you're being Sephardic by being by uh, by eating the rice on Passover, it means you got to be careful as a Sephardic to uh, avoid the milk and the fish together. The Chabad way is that we don't eat rice on Pesach, but we avoid only actual fish with actual milk. Milk products like, like cheese are fine to be eaten together with um, with a fish. Okay, comment from Esser the plague how they would feed their elder kids larger portion more of the grains, which in consequence killed their children. I was referring to the Sephardic with the grains you mentioned earlier. Okay, so you're telling me Esser here that the um, Egyptians would give a larger portion of the grains to their children, which in consequence killed their children. I don't. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding why eating more grains killed their children. Um, I'm not sure. Esther, I, I apologize. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Why it is that you're saying that the Egyptians giving more food to their older kids caused them to be killed. Um, what that has to do with the Sephardic um, grains that I mentioned earlier. The leg, uh, You must be talking about the rice on Passover. What that has to do with Sephardic Jews being in ancient Egypt during the Passover story. I don't think there was a division between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews in, in ancient Egypt. The Jews were just Jews at that time. Remember, Sephardic means Spain. Ashkenaz means Germany. It was only after the expulsion of the, when the Jews were, were persecuted by the Romans, really. And they were sent out to those faraway lands that, um, or maybe even after the first temple was destroyed, that um, there were Jews living in Persia and in Babylon and in Sephardic lands versus the Jews that were later expelled to, to the more European countries. So that's really where it came from. But in ancient uh, Egypt, during the Pesach story, there was really no difference between the Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with that. The origin of the, of the prohibition against rice and other legumes is merely a rabbinical prohibition. And it goes like this. The Torah prohibits us in Pesach from eating five grains that are fermented. Only five grains. There's only five grains that are legally considered grains. And they are wheat, barley, spelt, oats, and rye. Wheat, barley, spelt, oats, and rye. They are the only five that are considered grain. Everything else is not a grain. It might look like a grain. It might smell like a grain. It might be baked like a grain. But it's not a grain if it's not wheat, barley, spelt, oats, and rye. The rabbis, the Ashkenazi rabbis, made a prohibition. And they said, they extended the prohibition that since there are certain things that look like grain and ferment like grain, even they're not actually grain, they are also rabbinically prohibited. And that's why they prohibited the legumes. Legumes would include beans, um, you know, you can make uh, flour out of beans, anything you can make a flour out of it, like uh, beans or rice or, um, I don't know, all sorts of stuff like that. Thank God they didn't include the potatoes in that prohibition. Potatoes should probably have been included in that, but thank God they didn't include it. And therefore we Ashkenazi Jews have what to eat on Pesach. We eat a lot of potatoes. But if they would have included the potatoes in that prohibition, Och and Vey would have been awful. So thank God they didn't. But that was the reason that we avoid the, the rice on Pesach is because it, the rabbis added a prohibition to protect like a guardrail from falling off a cliff, to, to, make, to make it um, more difficult to come close to violating the biblical prohibition. That's why they made a guardrail or rabbinical prohibition as is mandated by Torah. The Torah wants the rabbis to make rabbinical prohibitions to protect from people from coming too close to violating the actual prohibition. Anyways, I hope that answers your question, Esser. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me this morning. I'd like to conclude with a Kelmo Rachmi blessing for Bert Stoleman, whose yard site is today, and whose yard site, um, whose uh, neshama is being elevated in today's Torah study by his sister, Stephanie, and brother-in-law, uh, Jay Marmer. Okay. Um, here it is. Hey, Lamole, Rahamim, Shoichain, Bamaroy, Mamasim, Rahino, can fash, he know, Bamal, Lois, Gadoish, Motori, Makazir, or Kiamas, he must be smas, Rebd of Bravraham, Bernard Schleber, Shiolach, Lamai Bavur, Shinod, and Doka, Vadas, Koras, Nishmose, Beganet, and Timon Hoss, Elohim, Valraham, he must have a sister, Grand of Lilami, maybe it's Rora, Pistra, I must be smos, and Nina Halos, so even a Halmishka, maybe Sholim, Benima, Ramay, no God full of compassion, and dwells in high. Grant to rest upon the wings of the divine presence and the exalted spheres of the holy and pure, who shine as the resplendence of the firmament of the soul of Bert Stolerman, 
who has gone to his appointed world for, world for charity has been donated in remembrance of his soul, may his place of rest be in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, may the all merciful and shelter him with the cover of his wings forever and bind his soul in the bond of life. The Lord is his heritage. May rest in his resting place in peace and let us respond. Amen. I'd like to mention to everybody, we're having an amazing JLI class tonight at 7.30 p.m. on the, 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 the secrets of the Bible. It's the secrets of Joseph and his brothers, the understanding of the great schism that ran from the very beginning of the foundation of the Jewish people all the way through today to our souls and to the coming of Mashiach. It's a rift in a schism that goes all the way through from the beginning of the Jewish people till today. And it's manifest through the story of Joseph and his brothers. It's happening tonight at 7.30 p.m. If you're registered for the course, join us on the Zoom link at 7.30 p.m. And if you're not registered for the course, then just uh, uh, ask Ashley for the link. It's office at jewishgardens.com. That's office at jewishgardens.com. Or call Ashley at the office 561-624-2223. That's 561-624-2223. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie, and for, for dedicating today's Torah study for your brother who we buried together. That's how we met, I think. Um, that was our first meaningful encounter uh, all these years ago. I think it was in 2014, 2014, I think, when we uh, really got to know each other over the funeral of your brother. Anyways, God bless you and have a wonderful day, everybody. Shalom. Today's Thursday at 11.30. Corey's giving a class on Hebrew language through the Psalms of King David. That's Hebrew language through the Psalms of King David at 11.30 on Zoom, jewishgardens.com forward slash zoom that's georgegardens.com forward slash zoom thank you stephanie it's indeed 2015 not 2014 my mistake thank you very much um and i'm glad you got it andy yashikach everybody shalom have a great day